Officials are investigating a white powdery substance at the Delaware County Justice Center. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Jared Hall. And I'm Melissa Cordial. Officials say the powder came to came to, in an envelope to the Justice Center. New Center reporter Jason Luzak joins us now live from the news desk. Jason, what's the latest on the mysterious this mysterious powder? Well, Jared and Melissa, officials are not saying if this is anthrax or just a hoax. The Delaware County Sheriff's Office confirms to us they have a criminal investigation underway involving an incident this afternoon in Circuit Court 3. The Sheriff's Department says a court employee in the County Justice Center opened an envelope containing a white powdery substance. The building was not evacuated and the Circuit Court office was not closed, but the envelope has been taken into evidence. That is all the information we have at the time. Jared and Melissa. All right, thanks a lot for that report, Jason. Of course, this is a story we'll continue to follow, so please be sure to uh, tune in tomorrow on News Center at 530 for more developments. Meanwhile, in Indianapolis, follow-up tests for anthrax spores in the critical parts center have come up negative. An area where an anthrax-infested printer had been found was tested yesterday. Postal Service spokesman Darla Stafford says employees are expected to be able to use the entire building next week. Postal equipment from around the nation is cleaned and repaired at the facility. City officials say the printer was not used to process mail. And hundreds of miles from here, the latest now in anthrax threats in New York City. The, Man the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital is once again open for business today, one day after Kathy Wynn was buried. She was the hospital employee who became the first New Yorker to die of inhalation, inhalath, inhalation anthrax. More than 1,000 workers, patients, and visitors were put on antibiotics as a precaution. All tests on the building came back negative. Many workers say they feel safe returning to their jobs. And also in New York, thousands went to the polls today to elect a new mayor, and right now it looks like a dead heat. Maria Inahosa is covering the showdown over who will succeed M Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The latest polls in New York City put the two main candidates in a statistical dead heat. Many New Yorkers went to the polls early, sure of their choice. Some committed to putting a Democrat, Mark Green, back into City Hall after eight years of Republican rule by Rudy Giuliani. But some Democrats, many of them African American and Latinos, have said they would not vote their traditional Democratic line, stung by what they say were the racial politics played by Mark Green in the last runoff election against Fernando Ferrer, who wanted to become New York's first Latino mayor. Other New Yorkers, though, were heeding the call of a popular mayor. Rudy Giuliani has endorsed billionaire businessman Mike Bloomberg and told New Yorkers he was the best candidate to move the city forward. My experience in terms of building a company and managing people through economic trying times uh, and providing leadership to 8,000 employees and a few hundred thousand customers is, is, makes me qualified to lead the city forward for this period in time. The stakes are so high, the race is so close, and the contrast is so sharp between a Democratic public advocate who's been in every neighborhood and helped working families in every neighborhood, and a Republican billionaire who's out of touch with our neighborhoods, who has not one accomplishment in public life, and whose slogan is, money talks. I feel like, not just me, but the people that work with me gave everything we had after the city was attacked on September 11. So, you know, I'm really comfortable with what we did, and you always wish you had done more. And I'm uh, quite comfortable with Mike Bloomberg being the next mayor. But whatever the voters choose, it's their choice. The right to vote is a fundamental right. Uh, whomever is selected as the next mayor, uh, we will start the transition tomorrow. And although Mayor Giuliani had earlier hinted he might want to extend his term, the transition does indeed begin tomorrow. The mayor has opened up transition offices and has asked all of his commissioners to resign when the new term starts in January. Maria Hinojosa, CNN, New York. And Sh uh, Shanna Walters joins us now. Um, it's, it was cold out today, and I'm hoping it's getting warmer. No? No, it probably won't. It's going to be a little bit warmer later on this week. But um, as we take a look at our first forecast, we can tell that it's going to be clear. It's with a low of 47 right now. Southwest winds at 5 miles per hour. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Shanna. We'll... Uh... Look forward to that a little bit later. Well, French President Jacques Chirac is meeting with President Bush at the White House this week. Today was the first meeting in President Bush's 10-day diplomatic offensive to build up more support for the war against terrorism. 
Bush warns that the U.S. is not backing down from threats of Osama bin Laden or his al-Qaeda network possessing weapons of mass destruction. I wouldn't put it past him to develop uh, evil weapons to try to harm civilization as we know it. And that's why our coalition is, uh, uh, that's why I work hard to keep our coalition bound together. And that's why we're going to keep relentless military pressure on him in Afghanistan. Despite rumored uh, reports, U.S. officials say a U.S. helicopter did not crash in Pakistan on Sunday. In a briefing today, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld put those claims to rest made by Pakistani officials. And in the latest rounds of strikes against Afghanistan, tonight at least five explosions near the town of Bagram, just north of Kabul. Night vision video of the area showed several bright blasts in the sky, followed by black plumes of smoke. Earlier in the day, Northern Alliance commanders claimed two victories in their fight against Taliban forces, including the capture of the town of Kassinaday. That's just south of the strategically important city of Mazar-e-Sharif. The opposition also says five Taliban commanders and 400 Taliban soldiers have defected. The Federal Reserve Board decided to cut interest rates by half a percent today, sending stocks up to the highest level since September 11th terrorist attacks. The move gave investiga investigators high hopes for an economic recovery next year. Analysts see this as the move to boost the economy and push consumer spending. The Dow gained 150 points to close at 9,591. The Nasdaq rose 41 points to 1835. And smoking in public places could be a thing of the past in East Central Indiana. Next on News Center at 9.30, here are the arguments in the case. And find out the latest on a Ball State student injured during a post-football game celebration. Plus, how did a county jail mix-up result in the release of a suspected bank robber? We'll have the answers next when News Center at 9.30 returns. A mix-up between paperwork and a computer system has resulted in the release of a bank robbery suspect from the Delaware County Jail. News Center reporter Amy Weaker joins us now from the news desk with more on this uh, release suspect. Amy, how did all this happen? Well, Jared and Melissa, it all came down to a mistake in the arrest time of an alleged bank robber. Police arrested Dewan McFall Saturday for robbing the bank one on Madison Street. McFall's affidavit confirmed his arrest at 12.03 p.m. According to the Indiana law, the affidavit must be signed by a judge within 48 hours of the initial arrest. However, his arrest time in the computer was recorded at 5.23 p.m. The document was not delivered to a judge until yesterday afternoon instead of by noon. This resulted in McFall's release. Although Muncie police declined to comment on the mishap, the Delaware County Sheriff's Department issued a statement to the Muncie Star Press. Sergeant Brett McCord said, quote, If Muncie police are upset, they have a right to be. The mistake was ours. We should have taken the probable cause to the judge much earlier. We should have caught the differences in time. Muncie police are now planning to send the case to the prosecutor's office in hopes to attain an arrest warrant. From the news desk, Amy Weekert, News Center 43. And of course, Amy, it's really important that they get McFall back in the jail. Yes, it is. Uh, police say that uh, they believe McFall could be further involved with other robberies in the Muncie area, and he should be taken into custody for more investigation. All right. Thanks. Amy Weekert, live in the Update Center tonight. And a Ball State student is recovering from injuries he received after a burglar beat him while he was sleeping. BSU police say the student Brett Strubjack was at a friend's house when a man broke in and started beating him as he slept. Officials say the incident occurred at a near campus home Sunday morning and say nothing was taken from the home. Doctors at Ball Memorial Hospital treated and released Strubjack. Police are still looking for a suspect. The Ball State student who was seriously injured during the October 20th homecoming football celebration is recovering at an Indianapolis hospital. Doctors operated on Andrew Bourne's back at Methodist Hospital following the accident after the game. A fund has been set up uh, to help Bourne and his family. If you would like to help, you can send the donations to the Bath State Bank. That's in Bourne's hometown of Bath, Indiana. The Delaware County Commissioners have heard arguments for and against an ordinance that bans smoking in public places. It would not allow smoking in most locations accessible to residents under 18 years old. But it doesn't ban smoking in bars and hotels in, Eastern Indiana, in, in the eastern Indiana County. Health officials urged the commissioners yesterday to approve the ordinance to protect children from secondhand smoke. Opponents told commissioners they had no right to decide what people can 
and cannot do concerning smoking. The ordinance may come up for a final vote on November 19th. More financial help could be on the way for some Newcastle students. Officials there say they want to offer city-funded college scholarships each year. Two $1,000 scholarships are up for grabs. That's one to a male student and the other to a female student. But there is one condition. The recipients must return to Newcastle after graduation. The scholarship proposal is aimed at stemming the loss of the city's college-educated young adults. The measure must pass two more votes before it's finalized. Well, a, uni uh, a University of Miami freshman from Indianapolis apparently drowned after jumping into a lake on the campus. CNN's Gail Bright has more from Miami, Florida. Police say 18-year-old Chad Meredith dove into the lake in front of the popular Ratskeller bar and restaurant at about 5 o'clock this morning. Three of his friends surfaced. He did not. Obviously, we have very strong policies here at the university about swimming. Swimming is prohibited in the lake. Um, and certainly the students are aware of that. Had they been drinking? Uh, we're not absolutely certain of the situation right now. But you feel they may have been? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, the policy is clear, but they still do it. I know. I mean, it is a rule. You're not supposed to go swimming in it, but people still do go in it. I do know that. The university's new president, Donna Shalala, along with the police chief of Coral Gables, among the many on this tragic scene, all knowing that Meredith's parents, who live in Indianapolis, now have to live with a life so young cut short. Really yeah, we just, we just bring a card saying, saying, saying we're sorry. It's got to be tough, no matter whether you know him or not, just a fellow student. It is tough. Have you yeah, talked to anybody? No, we haven't really talked to anybody yet. So you heard about it because we just heard they sent an email out or something? Yeah, we got an email. Yeah, we are just everybody talking about it. So you're just bringing a card by? Yeah, just say we're sorry. Most friends and soon-to-be fraternity brothers of Chad Meredith kept to themselves this dreary day, knowing they too are mourning the death of a young man who died in a tragic accident that university officials say could have been avoided. Members of Ball, State, Ball State's Board of Trustees may have violated the open door law. The story from our partners at the Ball State Daily News. In tomorrow morning's edition, read more about whether an investigation is possible. Plus, Delaware County has a discussion over the new possible smoking ban. And find out details on Representative Mike Pence's visit to Ball State. These stories and more in tomorrow's edition of the Ball State Daily News. Well, Shauna Walters will be on with, uh, after the break with a full forecast. It's uh, looking a little good. It's looking a little dreary, but with, it should warm up throughout the week, good. so we can look forward to that. All, All right. right, thanks. High. And as we take a look at our weather almanac today, we see today's high is about 60 degrees with normal high about 54, so that's pretty normal. And today's low is about 29, and that's pretty cool compared to our normal low of 37 degrees. As we take a look at our highs, we see the high of South, South Bend has a high of 61 today. And Lafayette is falling in the 60s also, and so is Terre Haute. Muncie and Indianapolis are pretty running neck to neck. In Evansville, we see a high of 63 degrees. And look at our current conditions. It's going to be clear with the temperature of 47 degrees, humidity at 48 percent, southwest winds at about 5 miles per hour. And as we take a look at our radar, we see it's pretty clear in the Indiana area, but that may change tomorrow as we see precipitation is moving over into the east, so we'll be seeing that. And as we take a look at our satellite, we see that precipitation is moving down from the north, and it will be coming over into the east area of the U.S. And a look at tonight, we see that there is a, a cold front coming down from the north, and then that warm front is just moving down also. The high pressure is pretty much out of the east area, but it's still moving down to the south. And as we take a look at our lows for today, our lows are in the range from the 20s to about the 60s, and then in the Indiana Indianapolis area, we see that the 40s are running through. And a look at tonight's weather. It's going to be clear with the low of 41 degrees, southwest winds at about 3 miles per hour. And tomorrow morning it's going to be sunny with a temperature of 47 degrees. And tomorrow's highs, we'll be looking around the 60s, the mid-60s, so we can look forward to that. It will be ranging from 30s to about the 80s. And tomorrow it's going to be sunny with a high of 66 degrees, southwest winds at about 10 miles per hour. And a look at our three-day forecast, we see that Thursday it's going to have a high of 61 degrees with scattered thunderstorms. And Friday and Saturday is going to be pretty sunny with high about the mid-50s.
Oh, I like all of that except Thursday. The rain doesn't look too no. rain does not look good. So I think it's it's been a weekly thing. It it's nice I until about Wednesday and then on Thursday it starts it raining rain. again and by the weekend it's good. Oh. I, I oh, broke well. my umbrella. I don't want <laughs> I haven't carried my umbrella for the past <laughs> year, I think. So you just got to get wet and go with it. Yeah, Jared said he was running through the rain without one. Yeah. He's a senior now. He doesn't have to or something. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Shauna. Well, uh, Corey, you and anyone else who loves Ball State football was watching the TV tonight. Yes, Toledo, Western Michigan, big game tonight. will help decide the MAC West division. Our news on that and more Mid-American Conference football when New Center 43 returns. After handling Toledo what could be their only defeat of the season last month, the Ball State football Cardinals are joining the Rockets fan club, at least for a few hours. The Cardinals season lay in the hands of the Rockets tonight as they take on Western Michigan. Here's why. If Toledo beats Western, the Cardinals must go on the road in two weeks and defeat Northern Illinois to clinch the MAC West title. But if Western plays the spoiler, Ball State must beat Northern Illinois and Western in the final week of the season to win the West. And so far, Toledo is helping the Cardinals in, in every way as we take it to the Glass Bowl in Toledo, Ohio tonight. Gary Darnell looking for his second win in a row versus Toledo. First play here, early first. Chester Taylor takes it in from five yards out. Toledo goes up early 7-0, but Jeff Welsh comes right back off of a collapsed lung, finds Antonio Thomas deep, 39-yard touchdown pass. The game's tied 7-all. We've got a shootout. Then Toledo blocks a punt. Corey Morris picks it up, takes it in. Toledo's up 14 to seven late in the first quarter. But Jeff Welsh comes right back, finds Antonio Thomas again from 19 yards out, 14 all early in the second quarter. Then Chester Taylor gets in the act again. Tavares Bolden comes back, finds Taylor on a 12 yard slant pattern. He goes in untouched. They're up 21-14 at that point. They would add another touchdown late. They're up 31-14 at the half. Taylor late in the second quarter became the Rockets all-time leading rusher on a two-yard or on a six-yard run on a fourth and two play. Now, Talmadge Hill was the big reason the Cardinals won the game against Toledo. Hill was named MAC Offensive Player of the Week this, this week. Hill completed 13 of 27 passes for 303 yards and almost 24 yards per completion. The key play this past weekend was Hill's 78-yard touchdown completion to Sean Shembra. Hill is the fourth Ball State player to win the award the player of the week this uh, season, Hill's the BS, first BSU player to win the offensive award this year. Rockman Crable and Lorenzo Scott earned defensive player of the week awards. Corey Parchman earned special teams player of the award this week, this year also. Expectations have been high ever since last season when the Delta Eagles made it to semi-state. This weekend they look for a return trip to semi-state behind the lead, leadership of Chris Jackson and Joey Lynch. New Center reporter Tom Kozrowski has the story. Delta fans have grown accustomed to seeing plays like this from quarterback Joey Lynch and wideout Chris Jackson. This season, the two have become one of the most lethal quarterback-receiver tandems in the state. They almost seem to know each other's moves out on the field, and then Joey gives them signals. Joey will make a lot of changes and calls at the line of scrimmage, depending on the defenses. He'll signal Chris. Chris runs excellent routes. Of course, he's got great speed, so it works for a winning touchdown for us all. These two seniors are not only friends on the field, but off the field as well. Friends since childhood, the two grew up together on the game of football. He's been my boy since the uh, fifth grade, and so uh, I've been hanging out with him all of my life. And we always, when we were just at his house, we'd be playing football just for the heck of it. And we always do things together, and we have a close bond. Both believe they can use that friendship off the field to help get better results on the field, and ultimately lead their team to the Class 4A state title. You know, a lot of times out there, there'll be guys a little bit better and you a little faster. There's not many of the fashion Chris, but you know, every once in a while there will be someone. And uh, just being on the same wavelength and you know, being knowing what each other's gonna do timing wise, you know, that's so important in a football game. Head coach Grant Segunda says Joey and Chris are that special kind of one two punch that a coach never forgets. You know, there's been some good combinations, but I, you know, I, like I told you before, I wouldn't trade these guys for anybody, and, and I mean that. I, there's anybody in the state I'd trade those two for. As Joey and Chris lead the Eagles' drive toward the dome, you can be certain that this quarterback-receiver combo will not be forgotten by the Delta faithful for many years to come. Reporting from Delta High School in Muncie, I'm Tom Kozrowski, News Center 43.
baseball owners voted today late Tuesday to eliminate two teams before the start of the 2002 season, but they have not said which teams it will be. The Montreal Expos, Minnesota Twins, and Florida Marlins were the teams that have been rumored to be, to be up for elimination. Bud Selig said the possibility of moving teams has not been ruled out, but he added there are currently aren't any acceptable cities to move to. Merely transferring existing problems to another ownership group or another city would only exacerbate the problems, not resolve it, he said. All right. Thanks, Corey. Coming tonight. Thanks. All right. Well, coming up in News Center uh, at 9.30 returns, Shauna Walters will be in with your wake-up weather. Stay tuned. All right, Shauna, what, what, what do we have going on today? Well, tonight it's actually going to be pretty clear. Clear at about 41 degrees with southwest winds about 3 miles per hour. Tomorrow it's going to be sunny with a high of 66, so we can look forward to that. And with our three-day forecast, we have Thursday. Tomorrow it's going to be... Um, it's going to be scattered thunderstorms, so it's going to be a high of 61. And Friday and Saturday, it's going to be in the mid-50s. So that's pretty, it's going to be pretty nice. Yeah, but uh, the, the important thing, it's going to be cold in the morning. Yes, definitely. It will. So uh, make sure you have your coat. It warms up as the day stuff. goes on, I think I've, right. I've noticed. My winter coat during the day. Well, <laughs> thanks for joining us for News Center at 9.30. I'm Melissa Cordial. And I'm Jared Hall, News Center 43's and official CNN Student Bureau. Thanks for joining us tonight.